Air pollution is worse than war, smoking and AIDS put together. So air pollution is without doubt the greatest concern to public health currently in the world. This is a really pressing problem. Thousands of people's deaths are attributed to air pollution every year. Over the last 20 years, we've learned a lot about the air that we breathe and what it does to our health. Brighton & Hove has its own problems, just like any other big city. But the city's been fighting back, and today I'm hearing about the latest weapon in the battle to clear up our air. Do you know what's special about that bus you've just got off? It's electric. Uh, they're, aren't they carbon neutral or better for the environment, basically? They're like, they shut off their engines when they're not in, when they're not running and that type of thing, aren't they? Low emission and all of that. So it's half run on petrol and then what they do is they cut, it cuts off and runs to the electric. They're very quiet, that's what I noticed. That's what I asked my boyfriend. Why are they so quiet and he explained me why. Well, I wanted to find out exactly how they work and how they fit in with the overall picture. So I'm going on a journey across Brighton, meeting those working in the city to cut the emissions. But first, I'm off to meet a man who deals with the consequences of poor air quality at first hand. I was just walking down Church Road this morning and there was the smell of diesel fumes. There were lots of cars around and there were all these school children. And you begin to wonder how many of these school children will be affected by these pollutants that they are walking through on a day-to-day -day basis. Although we breathe in the air, and if we breathe in polluted air, it seems to us that it's the lungs that will be primarily affected. It's not just the lungs. It will find its way through our bloodstream. It will find its way to damage the small blood vessels in our brain, damage the small blood vessels in our heart, and of course, damage the cells of the whole body, leading to increased cancer risk. It's not an impact that is just relevant for somebody who is my age. It's an impact that's relevant for a little child because that is when the seeds of atherosclerosis are sown. That is when the pollutants will be creating the ground for future heart disease. Brighton and Hove City Council has responded to the dual threat of poor air and climate change. In 2015, it created the Bus Low Emission Zone. And in 2018, it vowed the city would become carbon neutral by 2030. Improving air quality will drastically improve our lives in so many ways. It's not just a one issue. It's, you know, it affects our health, our environment, and it's, it's linked to social justice and it's something that COVID-19 has really highlighted because obviously the nature of the pandemic attacking our lungs so people are really interested in this issue at the moment and it's thought that over 50 people a year in Brighton and Hove die um, prematurely due to toxic air pollution so it's that's how serious it is it really is a, a matter of life and death. One street in Brighton has been linked to poor air more than any other 18 months ago, it was named one of the worst in the country. Tell me why you brought me to this particular spot then, Andrew. I brought you to this spot because this is the Clock Tower Junction, the most polluted part of Brighton city centre. And the issues that we have here is that this is the busiest road in Brighton for bus movements. And coming in in this direction, they're all going and stopping on the gradient, which is very bad for emissions because when they start off, they're giving out more emissions than they would uh, in, 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 um, on, a, on a flat road. Um, now, the wonderful thing about the new buses is that they're completely zero emission along here and all the way along Western Road up to, up to Palmyra Square. So that's a, that's a massive improvement. Another solution could be the reworking of the Clock Tower Junction. Friends of the Earth have argued for many years that restricting north-south traffic would mean buses would flow much more easily from North Street into Western Road. And the good news is that the latest air quality report indicates that the city is moving in the right direction. 
So we've got some hot spots for air quality in the city. Um, the overall levels are actually generally quite good, but in some of those hot spots, the levels are poor, and that's where there's heavy accumulations of traffic, often where it's very slow moving. But it's also important to keep in context that buses contribute just 4% of the nation's roadside emissions. So there's a lot of other vehicles that need to be answering questions to. Are buses part of the problem or are they part of the solution? Oh, uh, very much part of, part of the solution. Remember, a bus can carry, uh, in normal time, a bus can carry 70 or 80 people in the space of perhaps two or three cars. It's, it's just obvious, really, that if you can get more people onto buses, you can get more cars off the road, you can improve the environment, and you can get people around very easily in this city. So if buses are part of a greener future, they're going to have to get cleaner too. The Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership has been helping bring together businesses to lower carbon emissions and clean up the air. Two decades ago, air quality emissions were not a, a major concern for people. It was more about fuel efficiency. And so from an air quality perspective, buses on a per vehicle basis were quite bad. We've come a tremendously long way. So the latest Euro 6 standards um, they demonstrate sort of a 90% improvement on where we were even, even just five, six, seven years ago with the Euro 5 standards. So we, we are getting to near, near zero emissions when it comes to new vehicles coming out, um, new buses coming out. They're very, very, very clean. The very latest buses have been on the streets since October 2019. The first 30 rolled out on the number 5 route and now 24 others are being introduced on Route 1 from Whitehawk to Mile Oak. In the last few years, the introduction of, of hybrids and hybridizations alongside the Euro 6 standards means that you've combined the two, the two challenges around air quality and climate change. So you've got the Euro 6 standard, which improves the air quality coming out of the, the back of the exhaust. And then you've got the hybridization, which captures braking energy, stores it in a battery, and then supports the bus as it, as it moves. So that, that then reduces uh, your emissions coming from fuel savings. It reduces the amount of fuel you have to use, and therefore you'll, you'll eject less, less emissions. So the ADL E400ER is then, it's a step up. And that gives you a whole, you know, a whole high streets worth of, of operation where no emissions are being emitted whatsoever. Well, it's time to find out how these buses work. I'm here at the Conway Street bus station and we're going to have a look under the bonnet. Down here to the right, you can probably see this uh, silver unit. That's the traction motor and that's what provides all the forward uh, motion of the vehicle. And in addition to that, it also provides a lot of the braking for the vehicle. Um, so in, the, in these ones, instead of wasting any kinetic energy through the brakes, we are able to collect it back through the motor and uh, store it again in the battery. It seems incredible that just these batteries can drive something as huge as that behind you. Yeah, so these batteries went, as you say, in the ULES, the uh, diesel generator is completely off and all the energy is coming from the batteries. The batteries run at 600 volts um, and they're capable of putting up 200 kilowatts of power, which is more than enough to propel uh, a vehicle the size of it. So next to the, the traction motor, we've also got the generator here, the big red item. So this is uh, significantly smaller than uh, an engine used in a traditional uh, diesel powered vehicle. Um, which allows it to be a bit more efficient but uh, in addition to that it's also because it's no longer mechanically linked to the driving wheels we're able to operate it at uh, whatever speed we choose and that allows it to operate more efficiently again so if we come over to the far side over here this section down here these big silver canisters that's what's known as the after treatment um, and that's crucial in reducing the emissions of the vehicle so there's two, two parts to that really. One's what's known as a diesel particulate filter, and that filters out a lot of the uh, um, harmful particulate matter that can otherwise uh, leave the exhaust. Uh, and the second bit is known as uh, an SCR, or a selective catalytic reductor. Um, and that uses uh, a fluid known as urea, that ejects it into the exhaust stream, and that reacts with the, the NOx, or the um, oxides of nitrogen, and turns them into um, less harmful gases, turns them into nitrogen and oxygen and so on, uh, and reduces nearly all the NOx emissions from the, from the engine. 
Inside, you're more likely to notice the high-spec interiors, the easy accessibility. Passengers told me it's a smoother journey. But Dan wanted to show me more technology. So the vehicle's fitted with a GPS system. It has a GPS antenna on the roof. Um, that's connected to this uh, control box down here. That, that recognises when it's inside the ULA zone and communicates to the rest of the vehicle, including the hybrid system, and enables it to enter the zero emission operation. Of course, outside the ULEZ, the generator has to switch back on to recharge those batteries. But the engine works in different operational modes, which will reduce any chance of spikes in emissions. And of course, as we've been hearing, these are the cleanest engines around. What's more, Dan and the team hope to eke out more from the batteries to establish two new zero emission zones. One here in London Road, and the other back where we started at the county hospital. I'm so pleased to be part of a city where the bus company is keen to drive this investment, keen to have zero emission buses and to have a program for increasing the number of these buses in the longer term. The Enviro 400 extended range buses are a big step forward, but the real goal is for zero emission, not just in areas of poor quality, but along the whole route. The end goal is to have a fully zero emission bus fleet. The government's target is net zero by 2050. So we'd imagine that at some point we would switch to just having zero emission buses in full operation. And I think the key thing to, to flag is hybrids are a step towards that future. And at the moment, the best bet to deliver that vision is with hydrogen fuel cells. Hydrogen fuel cells deliver much greater range than the current um, battery electric solutions that we've seen in some buses around, in some cases in Brighton and in some, in some other parts of the country. Those buses can't deliver the range that we need in Brighton and the surrounding areas and Crawley and, and other places we serve. Hydrogen fuel cells have got that range. So it's an expensive business. We're dependent on funding from Europe uh, that we've, we've still got access to, from other partners who are able to bring some funding to the table and of course from our own government. So we're really excited to see what government comes out with in the, in, the, in the coming months around funding extra zero emission buses. But we need to develop this hydrogen supply chain so that we can get the sort of buses that can deliver for people in the way we need to. I think I have a greater sense of urgency than some other politicians in the city. I mean, I am the youngest councillor as well, so it really feels like I'm fighting for my future, like like the rest of my generation. And it sound it can sound dramatic, but it's really it's really not. It's just we've got nine years to become carbon neutral, and active travel and public transport, like I was saying, is something that we can actually have a lot of influence on, which is why I'm really driven to make a difference in this area. Really, are you optimistic? 100% optimistic. The future. Absolutely optimistic for the future for our city, for our planet, and optimistic for our, our services because the need for mass transit is going to remain. In fact, if anything, it's going to be more and more important if we're going to fight climate change that we're able to switch people to, to, to mass transit options. The way it's done will change. We'll keep evolving it and we'll keep, keep um, learning new ideas and, and developing new thinking. But it's very much here to stay, very much an important part of the solution for the future.